I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching the sit down. You got to check out this documentary. It's pretty insane. Mark Landsman's here with us. Hey. Scandalous, the untold story of the National Enquirer. How's it going, man? Hey, man. How are you, Jim? Good. Yeah, good so how did you jump into this whole thing? Because like the National Enquirer has been kind of like the heartbeat behind American culture for decades at this point. Yeah. What fascinated you And it you was about something it? I never read. Really? I was like, yeah, I was just not, I wasn't a gossip hound. I right. wasn't that person. But um, I, the story really kind of found me. I mean, I think like a lot of us in 2015, 2016, I was having these kind of bizarre mm -hmm. out-of-body experiences yep. in the grocery store, you know, in the checkout line, looking at all these headlines about, you know, Hillary hooked on narcotics and uh, she was going to jail apparently, or maybe she had six months to live. Apparently she was always near death. <laughs> and um, the flip side of that being that, you know, Donald Trump was apparently the second coming. Mm. So that was a very surreal universe for me. And I started to kind of feel like, well, what's, what's happening here? Mm. This is like this, I'd never seen this before. I mean, I go to the grocery store a lot and suddenly there's just this barrage of headlines in your face at the checkout counter. So that was the first kind of moment when the inquiry started coming on, on my radar. And that was before the New Yorker started doing any of the reporting about, you know, alleged connections between the campaign mm -hmm. and the paper. Um, and a few months after that, my wife's best friend's parents were in town in California, in Los Angeles, and invited us to dinner. And at that dinner, my wife's best friend's dad starts regaling us with all these stories oh my gosh. about his former career as a tabloid reporter for the National Enquirer in 1973. Wow. And it was like listening to a CIA agent to tell you what it was like. To <laughs> Unearthing like, all these secrets all of this the stuff. whole deal, yeah. Disguises, espionage, bribes, crazy sources, like paying off you know, nurses at hospitals or hairstylists or people's brother-in-law or disgruntled chauffeur or agent. Um, you know, bottomless expense accounts, world travel. Insane expense accounts. Triple yeah. salaries Crazy. from what they were making at yeah. mainstream. Post. And I just started to think, you know, this is a pretty fascinating story. And that, that got me really curious. So there's all these different elements to it. In your mind, what sticks out the most throughout the entire thread of, you know, going back to the 50s and 60s from Elvis to Donald Trump? Like there's been a consistent yeah. National Enquirer presence here. I, th I think for me, what, what's most striking about this story is how much the Enquirer changed over time. Mm. Like the paper is the main character in the movie. It's kind of like Frankenstein, right. this sort of just monster. Just always looming, yeah. Just this <laughs> mad monster that gets created in the 50s, you know, and sort of gets unleashed on the public by this guy, General Russell Pope, who founded the paper. But the intentions were not like, they were pretty like normal intentions. It's like sell a lot of papers, mm -hmm. give the American public, you know, mainstream America, something to escape from what was going on in the country at the time, which was Watergate, Vietnam, right. you know, gas lines, racial strife. It was kind of a form of sort of like, you know, let me curl up with a nice cup of coffee and read about Elizabeth Taylor mm -hmm. and her weight gain. And so I'll feel better about myself, right. you know, or maybe I'll learn something about my future from a psychic prediction right. or the fact that like, isn't it interesting that another alien landed in Roswell? Right, we're gonna get some more UFO More UFOs, coverage, yeah. bring it on. Exactly. You know, and, and that would be what she would, you know, they called, the typical reader of the National Enquirer back in that time, Missy Smith in Kansas City. Mm. And they knew everything about her. They knew the kind of gossip she wanted to tell her girlfriends at the beauty parlor. They knew kind of the sort of human interest stories that her husband would be interested in. Um, and they just fed this content to the American public. That monster morphs over time. So by the time you get to the Trump campaign, it becomes a piece of political propaganda. Mm. And that was a story that I thought was important to tell. How did this paper that was obsessed with like celebrities and psychic phenomenon and all this kind of stuff, miracle diets and fad fads, morph into a very powerful, highly visible piece of political propaganda? And so that's what the story is that we tell. We, tra we trace the trajectory of that. Because uh, we wanted to know like how, how do we get here? Right. In this moment, yeah. however you define here, sure. <laughs> how do we get here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There was a time where they say like facts weren't important. We're going to exaggerate certain things, but they didn't touch politics for a really long time. Yeah. And then Gary Hart comes into right. the mix, and that really changed everything. So, what was the biggest impact of that whole Gary Hart story on the future of the Inquirer? Well, I think you know, Gary Hart was the first moment when uh, a political figure was treated like a celebrity, um, and uh, there's an author, uh, an outstanding New York Times writer named Matt Bai, who wrote a book about this, that the Gary Hart moment is the moment when the privacy wall, the firewall mm -hmm. that had been up between the press and the politicians just disintegrated. 
and at that point, all the gloves were off. Um, you know, because politicians have been doing all kinds of um, uh, extramarital sure, things absolutely. since the dawn of time. Absolutely. I mean, we knew yeah. about John F. Kennedy, we knew about LBJ, and there, there's lots of things that we knew, but the press didn't go after it. Um, there was kind of an understanding, you know, that you just didn't cross those lines. Um, because the politicians were not the same as the celebrities. Mm -hmm. With Gary Hart, um, the Inquirer felt like he's a celebrity. Mm -hmm. You know, he looks like a celebrity. He's hanging out with Warren Beatty and Jack Nicholson. Um, he's partying like a celebrity. Um, and he's challenging the press to go after him. And they took him up on the challenge. Um, and once they saw how well that sold, because the Gary Hart story sold like gangbusters, all bets were off. And then it was like politicians were on the menu from that point on. But before that point, in before like 1987, it, they hadn't been. Mm. So that was a really pivotal moment when a politician started being treated like a celebrity and you know, look where we are now. Right, we have a celebrity that Precisely. becomes a politician. Right. And for Donald Trump specifically, I mean, he's calling the Inquirer and tipping them off on yeah. his own social life. Yeah. Obviously the Marla Maples thing is a huge deal, but yeah. when it comes to him and that relationship with the Inquirer, like they had killed Bob Hope stories and Bill Cosby. Why was it different with Donald Trump when yeah. it came to the 2016 election? Such a great question. Um, I was really fascinated to learn that the whole term of catch and kill is a very contemporary term. Mm that the old school Inquirer guys, the men and women were like, we never ever talked about it as catch and kill, we just called it trade outs. So what they would do back in the day in the Inquirer is, you know, you're a very famous celebrity, the Inquirer has a very elaborate spy network, the Inquirer knows everything about you, you know, hypothetically speaking, we know you're sleeping with your nanny or this, sure. that, or the other thing. Um, so we're going to, rather than run that story, we're gonna work with your publicist and we're gonna trade it out for a story that our readers are really gonna love, like an exclusive with you at home over Christmas, um, you know, under the tree with you as your kids are opening right. presents, on the golf course with you, in the cart, you know, and those things were common practice that the editors at the Enquirer would do. They would take really scandalous information, they would say, we know this about you. I mean, it's a form of blackmail, yeah. but in return, what the celebrity is getting is phenomenal exposure, because at any given week, you know, 20 million Americans are reading and seeing you at home with your family <laughs> for Christmas, looking perfect. So it was image maintenance. The difference between that and Catch and Kill is that Catch and Kill was about then saying, okay, rather than like substituting the nanny story, we're gonna talk to the nanny and we're gonna convince her that her story is going to get told in one way or the other. And then we're going to make her sign a document mm. that then ensures that her story will never see the light of day she doesn't know this, but this, 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 this signing all of her rights away is basically guaranteeing that the world will never know. Whatever happened to her will never, will never be revealed. And that's a story that's caught and killed for the benefit of a powerful person and 100% of the time a powerful man mm -hmm. um, to protect their image. And that's precisely what happened with the Trump candidacy. And that's why we have, you know, I don't think we would have a situation where a company and its head have immunity if that weren't the case. Right, and it's one thing if we're talking about celebrity culture, celebrity relationships, we're talking about the White House, we're talking about the presidency we're here, talking about the and the fact that these things potentially influence an election, like that's a huge deal. And you know the whole history of the Inquirer, I'm sure you never could have imagined that at, when they first started talking about UFOs, that they would influence an election in 2016. Yeah, and you know, listen, we don't have metric proof. Right. It's, it's, you know, this is just, the film attempts to um, connect dots um, and leave the conclusions up to you. Sure. You know, it's, this is not a piece of pedantic uh, filmmaking. It's just really about hoping that people watching this, we always hoped with the film that it would raise a lot more questions mm -hmm. than pose answers to, because there are a lot of questions. But that's where we're at as a culture. There's so many questions. Absolutely. We're yeah. still asking to this day you know, as impeachment you know, uh, mm -hmm. hearings are unfolding, as people question what a fact is in our culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can we be at a situation right now where, you know, we just don't agree on the basic idea of what is a fact? It's wild. It's wild. Never thought we'd get to this point. Come on. Yeah. You know, but we understand that there are facts. Totally. This is, yes. you know, we don't live in some kind of altered <laughs> Star Trek universe right. where somebody presses a button and it's like you forget the fact that there's reality. So, you know, hopefully the film will encourage people to kind of look at the media that they're consuming. Where's it coming from, you know? 
Um, is it coming from a, a place that has a track record of credible fact-based journalism, or is it an echo chamber that is just reflecting back to them their own views? Mm -hmm. Is it propaganda? Yeah. Very and, interesting questions to yeah. ask. Yeah. And I think another interesting question is, what is the function of a National Enquirer or TMZ? Because from a pure journalism standpoint, you can make the argument that you're not supposed to pay people off for pictures and quotes and sourcing and that nature. Yeah. But there's also a very important function of getting this information. What they did in the O.J. Simpson case is a perfect example of that. Yeah. So how do you think about the function of a National Enquirer in terms of journalism in our society? Well, I think it depends on like what phase of the Enquirer we're talking about, right? So in the beginning, you could say that it has functioned the way that gossip has always functioned in every culture since the dawn of time, totally. which is that it's a human instinct, you know? And to talk about the sort of the rise and the fall of the rich and the famous and the powerful, like that's like ancient Greek and Roman stuff. Like that's just in our DNA. Um, uh, but then when you get into the mid 90s, particularly around O.J. Simpson, and the editor of the Enquirer at the time really was interested in proving to the world that there was some serious journalism going on there. And in fact, there was. Yeah, totally. There was. Just the pure number of people that were on that story. Like, you, ha you had it yeah. in the doc. It was like the LA Times had four people, and it was like 20 people yeah. from the Enquirer. Yeah, it's nuts. And, and, and But it's not only the number of people, but it's, it's what they uncovered. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Enquirer discovered that, in fact, O.J. Simpson was wearing the Bruno Magli shoes. Mm -hmm which was a key piece of evidence in the civil trial for the Goldman family. Yeah, totally. You know, they got that information because they were very well poised. You know, they had 20 reporters on the ground. L.A. already was the center of their biggest spy network because it was Hollywood. Right. I mean, that was it. Everybody was on the payroll. They knew people within Nicole's own family. It's crazy. They yeah. knew every. They had people on the plane with Marsha Clark. They knew everybody. And they had every, and everybody, you know, and it is a situation where you say, well, everyone's on the payroll. Regardless, they still provided that photograph, and at which, which was key evidence. And you have to ask yourself if that evidence had been presented in the criminal trial, yeah. where would, you know, what would have happened? Totally. So, you know, Maggie Haberman, who is mm -hmm. a Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter, one of the best journalists working in totally. the world Absolutely. today, bar none, um, she admits, she admits that we have to look at, at some of the things that the Inquirer did and acknowledge that they did, they did some things really right. Few and far between, but to not acknowledge it is to be living in some fantasy land. Yeah, you can't do that. They got John Edwards right. Yeah, you know, they got Ennis Cosby right. You know, the, the Bill Cosby's mm -hmm. the, the, his his son who was murdered. Right, and they got O.J. right. But then you know you have the current regime of the Inquirer, and everything changes. The agenda changes. The editorial changes. The content changes, and you start to see a paper that is using the idea of acquiring information and burying it for the benefit of powerful people. That's not journalism. No. That's something else. And that's frightening. What do you think of the future is of the Enquirer? You know, I don't know. I think, you know, it just, it just you know, it sold for $100 million. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when Generoso Pope sold, you know, when he died in 1988 and the paper went on, on the auction block, it sold for half a, nearly half a billion dollars. Uh, its circulation is at its lowest point in history, yeah. you know, but somewhere between 150 and 200,000 in terms of the physical paper itself, but we live in a digital universe, right? right. Here we are. Exactly. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the future of print publication is, is kind of, you know, this is, this is up for discussion, but um, I don't know. You know, what do we know about the National Enquirer? We know that from basically 1957 to the current day, it's been accumulating an incredible amount of information on all kinds of people. Um, and who knows where that information lies? If you read Ronan Farrow's book, which mm -hmm. is an outstanding book, Catch and Kill, you may think that it all got shredded because a giant shredder showed up at the offices of AMI and shredded all that stuff. But again, we live in, the analog universe is dead. Mm. So we're in a digital universe, so truly, there have been scanners for a long time. <laughs> People understand how to save things in a non-analog way. So I think where's the value in the Enquirer? Probably in a lot of information and in what they'll choose or not to choose to do with that information. And probably some sort of iteration online. I mean, it's yeah. online now, but, but you just know. in a bigger way. Yeah, yeah. and who knows, uh, who knows? We'll see. Mark, we'll see. it's been a pleasure. Thanks Thank so much. you so much. When can people check this thing out? November 15th in theaters around, select theaters nationwide.
There you go. That's Thanks. Mark. I'm DJ. See you next time here on The Sit Down.